Here we are back again in the white room. Hello, Mariah. Hi, Simon. And hello, Linda. Hello, Simon. <laughs> we have the we have you via telephone connection to the UK. Where are you actually? Uh, I'm in a little town called Burton on Trent, which is kind of between uh, Derby and Birmingham, one of the most central points in in England. Um, yeah, central towns. Great, and yeah, we um, are having. Today, our regular podcast live, we are streaming live. We are happy uh, that we are live, that we managed to do it every two weeks. And um, and it today it fell uh, coincidentally on International Women's Day. So, happy Women's Day to... Happy International Women's Day! Both of you, or maybe to us also, or to me also, happy I think. Too, I think. Absolutely. <laughs> And uh, of course, um, that will also be uh, the topic, I think, of today. And um, I just want to start with maybe uh, reflecting again on what this podcast is with with Mariah. Maybe uh, we can improvise again. What is this podcast about? I was thinking that it's also like a little... Uh, in, in German, we have the newspapers and then there is the classy, there is the other, other, other different... Um, The different, um, there's politics and economy and sports. And then there is something called feuilleton, which is, it comes from uh, the French feuille, so which means leaves. So I, I imagine always it's like stray leaves of everything which does not fit in the other. So it's mo mostly culture, culture and, <laughs> and also philosophy and uh, everything which is not really necessary. It goes in there. And uh, it can happen. The gossip that section. The, yeah, the gossip is something else still. But there you can have a, a right wing paper have actually left wing thoughts in the feuilleton. So in this, uh, because it, uh, it's only the, the thinking people, the people that think and don't act that read it, and so it's not very, <laughs> it's not very dangerous. <laughs> so, but the I like the image. <laughs> very nice. <laughs> I so, do think we have a dash of gossip gossip section in yeah. our white room, though. A and, gossip corner, maybe. Yeah, and so this is uh, also kind of feuilleton. Some, we just bring our stray leaves, which we found on the street. And in these last two weeks, we bring to the podcast and, and, we, and we see what comes out of it. And it's, of course, related to what we like, related to our work, which is in theater or also in music, uh, in performing and um this is our our basis that we just talk about what we what we like to and uh, we develop the topics while speaking this is called in german the fabrication of thought while talking so it can happen that we come up with new ideas or with new thoughts also while talking which we did not No, before. This is, I think, also kind of a objective for me. And it's also quite risky sometimes. <laughs> Especially when you're live. But <laughs> What do you think? What is this podcast about, Mariah? Um, yeah, it, I, I like very much the image of the leaves that are floating in the wind. And... Um, And I also like the image of us taking a walk every Monday night um, through topics. And sometimes we pass topics that we had never thought we would pass. And um, and it reminds me, this these talks that we have, it reminds me that you can speak about everything and you don't have to have the responsibility or the goal or maybe the burden of solving any problem. If you just take a walk and see the sides and maybe find a new plant or a new flower, or you meet someone that you never expected, then that is what makes the walk worthwhile and valuable and enjoyable in the end and, and very healthy. Um, so that's what I very much like about our Mondays uh, and, and 
one objective for me. Take a walk. Don't solve any problems. Actually, Simon, I think you said that to me uh, last week when we were speaking about the Easter Village project, on which we will speak a bit more later. Um, don't solve the problems. You're not making solutions. <laughs> And uh, it's a deep, it's a deep thought. It connects to uh, big thinkers, bright thinkers like um, Donna Haraway when she says, "Stay with the trouble, you know, don't solve the trouble." And it, that's where it connects to theater. And now I finish my walk. <laughs> it connects to theater in that, you know, when there's when there's no trouble in the performance, it's very boring. You need trouble that's the heart and the soul of it and then you dive in yeah and that's where you find all these nice tensions and colors and the uh, contrapoints and everything that makes it work and then you step out again and luckily these uh, days we don't need a happy ending or any kind of fake resolution we can just leave the trouble yeah and know that it is still alive Yeah, I think we should be like, the, uh, what I connect to this, what you said, is ambigu ambiguity. Mm -hmm. So I think I think that what is the tendency sometimes is to want to have everything solved and clear. And yeah. and are you this or are you that? Are you, yeah. no? Can we find a point to this? But and actually, Simon, oh, sorry, I, I interrupt you. It's, no, no, I'm please. sorry, I do you, that a lot. I get so excited. No, you, <laughs> please. <laughs> Please do. But it, yeah, great. Because it, it's where jazz comes in, you know. It's, I always felt with jazz, which was why it have a lo little bit of tension with tap dancing, actually, is that with jazz, you don't really want to come down on the beat. It always takes another upbeat to, <laughs> to have some kind of open-ended, um, also harmonically. Many times it stays, there's always one... Even when it comes back to the to the final note, there's always one note, like a seven in there, that that is yeah. But maybe, you know, it keeps mm -hmm. the potential open to the future. And this ambiguity is uh, is uh, is exactly there. Yeah, that's why I think jazz is so uh, challenging to some people who just want to end on the four and and have a good solution, a resolution of the harmony. <laughs> Yeah, I think so. I, I I would like us to be also a podcast of ambiguity. It's not easy. Lovely. You're you you tend you tend towards wanting to solve a problem, and also if you are faced with a real problem, that you are affected also by yourself. You also are. It's difficult to accept that different realities exist at the same time. And this this concept of ambiguity I take from a book which is called The Culture of Ambiguity. I just will. It is a very interesting book. It's from, by a German Islam sci how do you call it? Islam not Islamist <laughs> but Islam. Yeah, I think you Islam call it scientist, um, Islam Islamologue, Islam Islamology, I don't know. Studies in German Isl Islam Wissenschaftler. So he studies uh, the religion of Islam. And um, and uh, he wrote a book, The Culture of Ambiguity, a different story of the Islam. And just mm. very briefly, that he says that the story of Islam, the story of the interpreting of the, the Quran, the Quran, has mm -hmm. been a story of a lot of ambiguity and playfulness, which mm. only so in the in the in imagine there is at the same time one thousand and one nights, which is a erotic tale of uh, no of uh, of action and horror and a lot of er i mean there is uh, penises and vaginas everywhere in this in everywhere the, in lying the, around yeah <laughs> really explicitly in the one and uh, uh, if you read the real translations so 1001 nights and uh, and also the quran and uh, poetry in the Islamic in our Middle Ages, in our Euro European Middle Ages, but which was the Islamic uh, 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 great time, how do you say, a gr uh, culturally very vivid time hmm. of science, and and there was kind of a play uh, playfulness around interpreting the Quran, and uh, that hmm. which is not known in the 
in the Christian um, cultural sphere because we have dogma. And in Islam there is no such thing as dogma because yeah. there is no church. It's beautiful. There eh? is no Vatican. It's true. Yeah. And just uh, the f the commandments of what you should do. Yeah. Not what you should necessarily And so he described I cannot yeah. really uh, relate to that because uh, but he describes how in detail how different scholars of Islam uh, enjoyed enjoyed playing around playing with the interpretations of the Quran. Mm -hmm. And somehow, I don't know, somehow the concept of one truth did not exist so it was different yeah. truth at the at the same time yeah, yeah. The, this is the this thing of action no? action exists the beautiful biography of um, uh, karen um karen armstrong i think she's called of mohammed it's very very beautiful she comes to the same uh, mm. uh, point as you describe and very only beautiful. encountering the western colonization Islam has to choose two different ways. The one way is reforming, reform Islam, which is going towards modernity, no? like laicist Islam. Uh, this is one reaction. And the other is fundamentalist. Mm. No? These are like two responses to the Western um, control and to the Western um, dominance of the Islamic world. So again, it's all our fault. <laughs> again, with no escape. There's <laughs> <laughs> no escape. So, so we want to uh, be. I I like this the culture, this expression of this ambiguity. Yeah. And he in this in this book coined the phrase which is called tolerance of ambiguity. So you tolerate ambiguity, Beautiful. and this is very difficult, but it's Beautiful. it's nice. It's good <laughs> if you tolerate ambiguity. And um, so how do we come from here? I'm I smiling because when I spoke to Linda just two hours ago, we came exactly to this point. And Linda said, this is the strong thing about um, uh, dialogues. I think you mentioned the strong thing about Eugenio Barba in his writings with the floating islands. Um, so it's a, it's a wonderful segue to you, Linda, and thanking you again that you take the time to spontaneously, is that the right way to say this? Spontaneously yeah. or spontaneous? Well, that's the right name, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are, not, we are not only glad that you're here because of your uh, work, and but also because you, we are always happy if a native speaker comes on the podcast because we feel so bad sometimes that we do it in English. I, me especially that I'm, I discover all the time how bad my English actually is. I really am embarrassed. <laughs> it's really, um, I'll come back to that. But I think going back to it, firstly, I probably should say hello and happy International Women's Day and clarify two things. Uh, also, happy International Women's Day. So with the X oh. instead of the E uh, to be trans inclusive. Um, Perfect. Uh, Thank you for that. I identify, I identify as a feminist. I'm not a ra radical feminist, um, and I have absolute allyship with those trans women, um, or women X, or women, or what them, or they, or whatever way you want to identify uh, within that. Going back to the original question, I think it's uh, about what this is. For me, all performance is relational. Uh, and what I love about and why I was so happy to kind of, with very little notice, to kind of go, hey, I'll, yeah, well, of course I'll join you, is because there's something about, uh, so, okay, if all performance is re relational, then actually you could say that about anything. And, you know, and that harps back to kind of Einstein's or his wife's theory of, of relativity um, and notions of relator and, and picks on, on many kind of uh, science, scientists um, or philosophers or whatever they were called back then. But the real question in if all performance is relational, and this is why I call, you know, um, I, I talk about relational performance all the time, then the real question is, is about actually uh, where power 
is distributed. Um, and Karen Barad talks about this and mm -hmm. uh, quoting Niels Bohr. And what I love about this is that I feel like I'm contributing towards a, a dialogical um, experience where, where actually the power is distributed and there's a real trust there between, you know, all of us here to make something mm. happen in this potentiality and possibilities. Um, I love the idea of the taking a walk, uh, you know, however, um, as particularly <laughs> on International Women's Day, often the ground on which each individual walks is very different. But what this podcast for me does is that it celebrates that difference and it doesn't ask you to hide that difference. In fact, it in some ways asks for the exposure of that in a, in a beautiful uh, space or place that has been created. Um, and in some ways, you know, when you're talking about the, the, the culture of the ambiguous, uh, of ambiguity and the, the Western one of the, the kind of split, uh, as you were, um, in some ways, that's actually about, regardless of who's responsible for that, it's actually about the relation. So, so the text kind of going, uh, some would argue, you know, what is Western? What is Eastern? What is, you know, what is that? Um, the, there's kind of some people who kind of talk about North Pole, South Poles or different, uh, so the whole notion of East and West is, is kind of getting disbanded because in some ways it was a, a quite, <laughs> to use the word that I'm trying to go against, a quite Western um, construct in itself. Normally when ships were kind of sailing out to colonize the, the lands further away from where they were. Um, but yeah, so that, that kind of, a, a kind of text coming um, and being encountered by someone else, then it changes the relation. You know, any text, and we see it in theatre and performance all the time, so I can t pick up. Uh, I was about to go to Samuel Beckett, but maybe not. Um, I can pick hmm. up a, a, a play text. Actually, Samuel Beckett was working against this. Um, I feel uh, I can pick up a, a kind of playtext. So my interpretation will be separate to yours. Uh, I, I, I'm not necessarily an expert on uh, Quran or, or Islamic text by any means, but kind of transferring it over to kind of something that I may know something about is mm -hmm. you look at, for example, uh, the Bible, and that text was written. 500 years, if not more, after, you know, it was actually written down, 500 or more years after these events were supposedly after taking place. So you kind of question the system on that. And also, I mean, again, on, on, on International Women's Day, I think of uh, in Ireland, where I'm from originally, um, the, there are a patron saint. So our patron saints would be St. Patrick, who on the 17th of March, there are parades and parties all around the world. Um, however, the real uh, St. Patrick wasn't from Ireland, he was from Wales. And the real patron saint of Ireland, and she still recognizes the patron saint of Ireland, is St. Bridges. Yeah. And she was written out of the history because it suited the Roman Catholic Church's patriarchy to actually have St. Patrick as the patron saint of Ireland rather than St. Bridget, who was a native and did so much work apparently uh, within Ireland. Um, so in a way, that's about relations again. That's about who holds the power to make that choice and historically that has for a large amount of time been men. I've just seen this amazing, amazing, uh, I would call it an artistic process, uh, project, 
but they would probably call it a historical action. This group of women in where I'm from in Caring, County Tipperary in Ireland, that's my local town. And these women uh, wanted, they, they published this book, which was called Daughters of Eastgig. Uh, Care is the anglicized name that was placed through colonization on the town. Um, but really, the, the Irish Gaelic name is Chahardun Eastgig. Um, so they call themselves Daughters of Eastgig. And they published this book in 2018, which got the Tipperary Best Book Award, about the, the, the women of, of this town. They're originally from a historical society. Um, and one of the women's, uh, Josephine, I believe her name is, went in and was, you know, listening to all these lectures from the Care Historical Society and going, I'm never going to see a moment where I'm going to hear, um, you know, all the women you know, a, a massive force of women on, on every single panel, on every single narrative, that the majority of these the things that we're talking about or the people we're talking about are, are women. So she got together with this kind of group of other women and they wrote this book. And then uh, last night, under the cover of darkness, in collaboration with all these other women, they decided to get these, you know, these blue plaques that, uh, are placed on buildings that say this person lived here or this person of importance yeah. lived here and stuff. Um, so they decided to just print out these um, and land them on, on kind of placards. And actually it was designed by a, a native artist uh, from the town. And, uh, and under the cover of darkness, these women dressed in kind of 1920s uh costume and because it's during COVID times and they placed all these over I think it's 24 or more plaques around the town and this town is quite famous it's a beautiful heritage town it's a beautiful mark town with a very very famous uh, castle which is Care Castle and uh, so they, they went to the streets and uh, just landed all these placards everywhere and there were people who were celebrating from nuns from women who were getting picked up and then transferred to kind of the, um, because historically women, if you were got pregnant out of wedlock, you went to these, uh, well, workhouses or women's homes or, or usually ran by by kind of uh, nuns, etc., to have the baby. And those babies usually got either mass murdered, as in, in tomb, or were trafficked over to Australia or were trafficked yeah. over to America and taken away. So these women have kind of uh, put all these placards all around the town and you can, you don't even have to, uh, so you don't even have to go to the town to view this. You can view it virtually and you can go online and you can go and do the walk to each placard and this audio description happens. But it was all just happened overnight. No one knew about it apart from this small group of people and the police. And they just, you know, it was this real uh, disturbance of the space. And that and this was yesterday? This was last night. So it's all just released today and all the, yeah. the stuff is kind of going on. And it's just fantastic. And I've, I genuinely feel like I've never been so proud of, of my, my kind of local town. Yeah. In that, and to know that, you know, I'm from a very, an upbringing where it would have been a kind of male dominated society that if you go to a pub, the man would go and order the drink and stuff like this. Um, you know, the woman, woman wouldn't sit at a bar and, and, uh, yeah, so it's quite a, a, a historically, uh, traditional, although what is tradition? Um, upbringing and, and environment and ideology and I just love that these, this group of women are just absolutely disturbed that which is fantastic um, How was the reaction area. of the town? It's been great they've been on the national news they've been on um, the national radio it's just, it's just gone massively viral so you can find them at Eastgig which is I-A-S-C-A-I-G-H on Twitter um, yeah, and they're just, uh, yeah, I, it's just fantastic. 
Uh, but that in, in, in itself changes the relation, you know, the action changes the relation. They've changed the, the scenography. They've changed the, the history for the herstory. They've kind of foregrounded a herstory over a history, um, which I think is, is so beautiful, such a beautiful action. Wonderful. Yeah, thanks for sharing. It's nice to hear that um, because in I think here where I am living, um, there are not so many spontaneous actions. It's not for Women's Day, International Womix. Womix. How do you say that? Womix. Womix. Womix Day. And it's great to hear that uh, in some places it's really alive and people are taking uh real actions it it's very heartening actually i feel that would never not i can't say never but it would not happen here so easily how how is it in germany uh simon or where you are is there any uh is there a lot of attention yes or actions yes yes and there's different um so Berlin, for instance, in Berlin, it's an actual uh, holiday. I think uh, they made it, wow. it's new, so I don't know, <laughs> some years ago or maybe last year or that. So it's made, it, it's a real holiday. Today they, they don't have to go to work, which I really like. I think there should be more holidays. <laughs> um, yeah, one each Anyways. week, why not? <laughs> <laughs> but um, this is interesting I, li I like that there's a lot uh, going on then there is of course the, the, the social media uh, um, different bubbles reacting I think but the, it's a strong there's a strong uh, movement that is also uh, mm. giving voice which, uh, which is very good there is of course also part of society which is uh, reacting hostile towards this which yeah. is maybe maybe 20 percent i think could be um so it's it's a, lo a lot and then there is a lot of people i think that really don't care especially or they don't really i don't know especially like and this is more or less what the town here is where i am i mean not that they don't care but it's a very uh, bourgeois bourgeois town so quite settled and in my neighborhood here where our theater is there's a lot of classical um, how could you say that uh, uh, images of marriage and of family so a lot of women I mean old people no? a lot of old people here a lot of women that maybe don't they don't even have a driver's license or not a lot but some yeah, they don't, or they don't drive. Uh, and this is just... But it's because they come from also the, another time, from 50 years ago when they married, or 40 years ago. And then there is another uh, part which, where the feminism sunk, I think, merged with capitalist establishment, which is also interesting. <laughs> you know, women entrepreneurs that um, um, also have a strong voice uh, here. I, I, there is a kind of a group here also in, in, um, uh, in, in my town, which meets, so they empower women to be entrepreneurs, have a women's network of entrepreneurs, which is of course good. Um, at the same time, it is like feminism without emancipation without economic emancipation of let's say the the classic uh, marxist no emancipation of the worker or the the system of capitalism so it's a little bit different maybe it's it's um, this is yeah different different parts it's it's um, yeah yeah Different parts of and society, but it's it is, and this is of course it is. Uh, I think um, it is a mainstream, or it's not that a lot of people disagree with the idea that uh, women's emancipation is important. 
Maybe now it's the struggle more with the X, no? That it also gets more normal. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, I, I have feeling. I don't know how how it is in the in the UK, but in in Holland, I think a lot of people think that you know that's kind of old hat. It's old news, and uh, and we are, we've passed all that, and there is no, you know, what should one do? Uh, everything has been achieved. Women can work. Uh, women mm -hmm. can study. Women can, but um, and and so they have the feeling that feminism is not. Uh, Yeah, or emancipation is not mm. needed anymore. Yeah, and um, I think in the se in the light of what we started with, stay with the trouble. Stay within the. Don't ever accept that the problem is solved. Life goes on, and it and it never ceases to uh, need need attention. These uh, these issues, and they creep up. On the through, through the back, when you are thinking, uh, "Wow, the front door is is closed," <laughs> you know we did a good job, and then in a weird way, it it bites you in the ass. I like to uh, when I just add. Uh, I like very much an old. And this is the trap which I said with uh, the feminists with who merge with the capitalist establishment. A, a trap of thinking that the question is solved. Yeah, you're right, Mariah. Because what is some a little bit solved is that maybe, like Marx said about the slaves, slaves or the uh, in Europe, no, the, the feudal state, the slaves. They were not called slaves in Europe, but I don't know what the English term is. Were freed to be free to be workers no so they were free to to have to sell their free yeah to they exactly this, this their is, bodies they they, yeah. they were free to have to sell their work to <laughs> and this is the i think so one side of feminism is because capitalism as also uh, the marx and engels said in the communist manifest Capitalism dissolves everything, every hierarchy, uh, because every hierarchy becomes a limit to capitalism. One can say blah, 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 the details are, but it's somehow uh, true that capitalism strives to make everybody free for labor. So hierarchy in the sense that the woman is in the house or is... Uh, you know, Uh, that you cannot work and it's bad for the capitalist uh, system so it strives towards some kind of uh, emancipation but what kind of emancipation is it this is always the question no and um, but even that i think the pay gap is not solved <laughs> so even capitalism did not um, could not yeah um, mm. And I, I, I mean, I, I think it depends yeah. on your, your cultural context in a sense that <clears throat> I completely understand what's kind of been posed. But for me, you know, International Women's Day originally was founded as a result of, you know, it was the suffragettes. It was uh, against the hierarchies. It was a, a kind of placing your, your hope um, in, in, in this to to come about change um, and like any idea or successful idea or idea that has in some locations or spaces or places caused change there will be the modification of that um, however uh, for me you know it's very easy to to celebrate this and actually it's a privilege to celebrate it I recognize that I'm completely privileged that I can just celebrate it because there is some countries and cultures where, where that is absolutely mm -hmm. not the case. And also within that, um, you know, I think that there is this whole image thing. It's now become a kind of, uh, it's kind of like uh, recycling that a lot of people are kind of going, hey, Uh, I look at me, aren't I great? Because I recycle. I'm so so environmental. When you're not greenwashing, that, 
yeah, that you're, you're kind of, you know, current where I live, that recycling has gone to, uh, it's called a, a waste to heat management. So they get energy from burning recycling um so it's you know it's on the surface that it, it's this kind of image thing of being you know and, and certain companies love that image of being progressive and supporting the workers but the reality you know inside the uk is that just on the pension fund there is, we are talking about a hundred thousand on average there is a gap between uh, men and women if you are, are dividing it just into those uh, genders, um, they, there are there is a gap of a hundred thousand pounds in real terms in a pension between a, a male and a female, um, which is deeply problematic. Wow, that's so huge. I think I think there's fair play. You know, all your image culture of of using this this feminist branding, you know, within within the culture I live. However, I'm more interested in what action and what steps you're taking within your company mm -hmm. in order to sure, sure, you know, that actually it's not just an image thing for you. Yes. It's not good enough mm. to just put it on your brand and use kind of a rights movement, what was essentially a, a, a kind of rights movement and a protest movement, movement against the hierarchy to use that as some kind of... Uh, brand or kind of advert for you when really underneath you're not you're not doing what's right by women or women ex-workers uh within that and also i think for me you know regardless of how far i feel we come in in where i live and where i'm from there is still work to do you know, in, in other countries mm -hmm. and in other countries. And I feel it's really important to actually recognize the privilege in, in which that I have and to, to prop up the work within that. Again, you know, it's probably uh, really important to clarify that, you know, there are certain feminists who are interested in in actually kind of just reiterate, changing the power structure, you know, completely toppling it over. And I understand that in any movement, it's kind of like a seesaw, you know, these balancing seesaws, that if, if it is one side is, let's say, side A is on top, that in order to get that kind of lower, you almost need to move that seesaw a little bit so that B is higher for it then to kind of balance in the center. And it's often that moment where B goes higher than A that the real tension kind of lies. But what I'm interested in is actually the equality and and the future argument that, you know, every day is International Women's Day or Women's Day or, or every day is everybody's day, you know, um, and that the argument becomes in some ways d d defunct. But having said that, it was it would probably be important in, in, in the future to still mark the day in recognition of those that came before that caused those, that change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The, we, it's, it's such a huge uh, topic and I'm, I'm just happy that we scratch it a little under yeah. the armpits. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, <laughs> and uh, tolerating ambiguity. So, but uh, I think it's, you're right, uh, I mean, what I understood or what I take from it, it's culturally, culturally, in a soft way, I think there has been a lot of progress, but in the power sense and the economic sense, there is uh, still a lot of work to do, especially. So, power and economics, and I think that is also closely related together. Um, so, this is the, this is the concrete changes Which, no the cultural the branding the images that you put ah yeah 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 uh, international women's day everything nice and but, uh, uh, but Simon, mm. i don't think it's right that you say the soft values is is always is well done and and the hard values is because i think it's more a misuse a kidnapping colonization or hostage taking whatever you want to call it of these soft values that is uh, that is going on what Linda describes 
and um, and actually that these soft values are the only way that the economic uh, and the power will change because they are following convictions they are following choice they are not given uh, uh, structures what it is is it's back to these women in in care with the uh, with the plaque Mm-hmm. And there was this uh, one of the women that they celebrated is this rebel nun. It's called a rebel nun. Uh, <laughs> who, uh, Always a good <laughs> I thing. The idea of a rebel nun. Good person and, uh, around. <laughs> and yeah, she her, her name was Sister Joseph, and she uh, was in the the convent, I believe, in care. Um, and she, the mother superior of the convent. Um, was uh, apparently what she said in she was writing letters to the bishop the local bishop basically calling the mother superior who was essentially a boss a tyrant and this which is for the time you know in the 1800s is, is quite a, a thing to say in these letters and mother superior was trying to take her veil away make you know you take a veil away from a nun and then then you know they're not a nun etc and uh she on the plaque that they have put up is one of the the things that she wrote in her letters, and she said, "No one is bound to obey when the superior is um, is commanding what we never vowed." Mm-hmm. And I think you know, in in that case, it's the superior, the mother superior. So no one is bound to to take out or do the actions that this mother superior is kind of. Uh, requesting when when we never vowed you know we never took a, a vow of this religion in order to to obey things that we believe are against this religion however you know in a more contemporary context like it's it's a beautiful fair kind of line which is that you, you know absolutely no one is bound to obey anyone who places themselves in a position over you um for something that you don't vow yourself. And I think our first vows need to be to ourselves. Um, Mm -hmm. And again, I recognize there is a privilege in in many of the ways in which I can carry out a a vow to myself rather than perhaps someone else. Um, And I do recognize that. And also, you know, there's something to say about International Women's Day is that Predominantly, and, and, and you know the suffragette movement, etc. It was privileged uh, white females, and mm-hmm. whilst I speak of a UK context where uh, you know I have privilege, uh, I have certain privileges, etc. I I also recognise that within the culture and, and <laughs> grouping of countries or nations or principalities in which I look our spaces in which I'm, I'm located, that the same privilege is not bestowed onto others of, of different races, not that I am. Um, I subscribe to the idea of race. I actually consider it to be human well, race rather than, you know. So, um, I mean, so yeah, I think it's really I mean, important to mark that. It's it's really complicated, you know, this exact thing that you say is so true. It's the product of a certain class of white women. Mm. And these white women were not floating in a void. They were shaped and living in a very specific context of pol- a political reality and, a, and a, a blooming capitalist market in which a certain drive towards, uh, you know, becoming an individual with rights and with... Um, also agency in this very individualistic way was privileged over being dependent or being tied or being in relation and uh, in a in a way you know that has shaped our very notion of what it means to be free or what it means to be powerful and this might not actually be something very real it might be a very much an image we have of freedom and uh, that's not. But in, in 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 kind of counteracting that, you know, when someone is is in a privileged position and can use that privilege to then help to make change for others, then you know, there's the that side of the coin also, and and also a recognition that those privileged women were also propped up by quite a number of men, 
um, in that, you know, and supported by totally. quite a number, totally. number of men in, in doing those actions. Totally. Um, But their the values time, and their their images were shaped by uh, by their culture at that time. They were very much a product of, of that time. And, and yeah. as we are actually still a product of that time so much, but we are, I think now um, on a point where uh, so much of the problematic sides of that uh, uh, position, that politics, that value system are becoming inescapable to us. The, um, and especially, you know, I, I mean, I have to give a little bit of background here because when I was studying law at the university, I did um, a minor, I think you would call it now, in gender studies mm -hmm. and uh, spent a lot, a lot of time. Actually, it was called women's studies at that time in, uh, in Holland under Professor Rosie Braidotti, who is actually still uh, very active uh, in the field. And I, f I, th I found the fascinating um, thing about that studies is that this question of, you know, how can we understand our values? How can we give them value without making them empty somehow, just a fabrication when we accept that they are maybe shaped by circumstances and by our political realities and our, by our cultures and not um, uh, uh, true. You know, there's nothing as contested as the so-called universal rights of, of coincidentally, not coincidentally, mankind. You know, no lawyer agrees. What are these universal rights <laughs> that we hold so dear? But we know this is some topic we should stay in communication about. And I don't know, this is a bit of a digression, but but it, it was a long uh, period of sitting through very, very difficult discussions about what is, you know, people bringing to the table female values and male values. And I almost almost hitting them because I was so frustrated. Like, how can you say there is something like a female value? Yeah, but what, what does that even mean? Or find the, the female side in yourself. Everyone has a male side and a female side. It's like, <laughs> it's so confusing. Don't use those words. Use yin and yang or whatever you want to use, but don't call them male or female. So it it is, it is very cool. Complicated. Well, it's not even as simple as male and female, even if you're talking about not just gender, but also, you know, sex. So biology would say there is a certain sex uh, at birth that is, uh, however, mm -hmm. there have been people who've been uh, kind of uh, have both or more genders uh, at birth. And also there's a great book called Inferior, which actually traces that whole quite new um kind of history of how we got to the biological definition of, of, of sex, which sometimes leads on to gender, um, you know, the placement of gender in individuals and then to have to uh, other oneself or, or to, to change from that which was ascribed to you or assigned to you because of sex. Um, But yeah, so so the, it's deeply problematic when you actually look back at the the, the roots of of uh, ident biological identification of of uh, sex by um, because it was actually a construct by many men uh, within it, and that book Inferior will say it's so much more than I will ever be able mm. to 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 yeah. uh, kind of speak about really um mm. but I mean it's really it's really easy to look back and kind of go oh you could have done this you could have done that oh yeah you were privileged um no but that's not what that. we're saying I think I don't think yeah. we, that's what we're we're not we're not judging uh them or saying that mm. because I'm super grateful <laughs> 
I'm the same, uh, you know. I but it's just that to to acknowledge that this is a, a cultural phenomenon brought on by a very specific group that has a huge impact on the, on the whole world because we are exporting our culture so strong. So that actually, in the end, many many believe that that is the way. It is a given. It is a universal right. But the values that are just behind, you know, the, of individualism and of uh, um, being completely self-sufficient, being full agent of your own uh, life, they are images. They're not givens in any way. They're images, they're values, they are uh, dreams, if you will. You know, things people they're aspire to. Culture, I think. Totally you know, I think constructed. that, that we're, we're completely allowed to perform in this way because that's the image things these companies and corporations, etc., want us to look like and perform like. And I'm probably going to receive a lot of threats after saying this, but, you know, there are locations, <laughs> including one not very far away from where I am right now, where there are secret groups of men who basically control towns and control cities and also control mm -hmm. the um, the... Uh, how do you call them, the contracts in which, who they are given to, etc. And, yeah. you know, I had a conversation oh, totally. with a friend of mine who was talking about this, and she said, don't go there. Do not say it. I said this publicly. I said this out loud, and I received threats. Wow. And the well, you know, they are listening to the it's, it's, yeah, not only nice people <laughs> listen to this podcast, so don't worry. <laughs> but <laughs> but you're right. Well this is the real, you. and this is the real cancel because there is this, there is this, this strange, um, Uh, how do you say this strange phantasma of, of cancel culture, which right wing people say, no, oh, we cannot express anything anymore. And uh, because we are canceled by the left wing majority, but they don't receive death threats. No, people who stand for this, for what you say, for feminists or, or, or uh, queers or people who, who fight for the rights of, of, of uh, everybody and, uh, and uh, mi minorities also they receive threats and they there are there is real um how do you say real plan or action to to have them um shut up and cancelled no so <laughs> it's over but also if you then want to progress your route is cancelled because in the majority of of you know most organizations you have to bypass certain individuals which, which is impossible so mm. so the system and, and and then there's that beautiful word that is always used that that is kind of thrown out there certainly within the uk is to even utter something like this is considered to be a conspiracy theorist oh, yeah. and the reality is is that for me well what do you mean by conspiracy i mean Do you mean actually thinking yeah. and, and going on, on evidence that you have and going on kind of what you've seen and what you know to be true, that, that because it's an alternative to the what you, you know, what certain individuals want to be presented, then you are, you know, conspiring against that system, a system which is actually based on the fundamentals of kind of patriarchy, you know? Yeah, conspiracy, you say conspiracy. One. Yeah, because you say conspiracy. I don't know, but I respond. I hope I get the right. There is a conspiracy. There is, especially in the internet, there is organized right wing male trolls who try to or organizedly attack mm -hmm. people, no? People, women especially. So the <laughs> it's not a. Uh, It's not a theory. Yeah, it's sort of it's a reality. It is. Uh, there are. You can even have. Um, um, mm -hmm. You can study this. There is evidence. <laughs> so. That's so interesting, Simon. That is. That is indeed. This uh, um, weaving of finger pointing take appropriating the very real and very valid uh, uh, complaint or reaction of people and then and then actually going ahead and doing it also <laughs> it's like 
blows blows the mind because it becomes so interwoven that it's almost impossible to unravel this tight fabric of lies, truth built on lies, uh, mimicking truth, resonating truth. But it is, isn't this also uh, food for theater makers? This game, oh, <laughs> just to bring us back into the uh, a little uh, towards uh, uh, a theater. This this game of uh, who who said that recently? We don't want them. Ah, yeah, Gonzalo Alocon, the the the. Uh, Cross pollination uh, member, he said, um, "We don't want our spectators to believe, but we want them to play with us, to go, uh, you know, buy into the game and play actively with us." And you know, this sometimes I I feel there there is a a significant shift. Just with the like with the ambiguity that you're not looking for a solution, and therefore setting yourself up for constant failure, frustration, and and kind of butting heads over who who did find the solution, and will get the praise or the money or the success, but valuing ambiguity, the living process, the thing that in the middle, that is not even you know graspable yet, but it it's extremely important it stays alive and present otherwise everything else petrifies and in this way maybe not going for the truth and not going into this game of fake news and then the trolls and then but how do we relate how do we play with each other in and and focus on that level well you said linda everything is relationships but we are sometimes relational. so focused on <laughs> relational, relational. Yes, sorry, that's the word. Where we are so focused on defining things as object that you could believe in and that would stay true forever. Facts, figures, numbers. And that's where theater comes in, back in. No? Play with us. We don't work, we play. <laughs> well, that's kind of, I mean, Stephen Berkov talks about in his book Graph, the, the fundamentals of theatre being, being based on play, and that's where we get the word in English play from when talking about a play text or a, mm -hmm. a written text. Um, I wonder, in a way, you know, going back to this, we don't want our spectators to believe but we want them to play with us. In order for them to play with us, what happens if they don't? You know, what what are we are we just attracting a particular type of person and creating our own echo chamber? Or if they don't want to play with us, mm, uh, what what are you sketching? What is the situation? Sometimes I feel that in performance practice, predominantly in, in kind of buildings in a way, is that you get the same type of regular audience, which is great, don't get me wrong, um, but it feels like you're preaching to the choir um, totally. or conducting a sermon to the choir. And, and I guess that's why I really like street theatre and, and, and work that yeah. take place. Yeah. Yeah. Because that don't require an invitation, but actually it's that accidental play and accidental relation um, that kind of connects and, and spurs something uh, which is very beautiful. And I think in some ways, if, if anything has come from these times, these COVID times, is, is a, a hark back to, you know, the street as, as a, a play as a, a beautiful being in which we can be in many different relations with and to. And, um, and there are many players, both human and, and more than human kind of players within that. Um, yeah. 
Well, yes, you know, I, 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 I do think that it's true. The street is somehow the most obvious and powerful, uh, or like straightforward example of this. No, this, uh, and but I do think that you are inviting. Even though it's it's accidental, it's not premeditated, maybe. But your whole being, your whole like, is open to engagement. It's it's inviting the other, and you will, you know, this. This is also how Gonzalo describes his process: that this the smallest uh, gesture of acknowledgement or or a willingness from an audience member, and he always in the first mo phase speaks of single individuals that you have to like relate to them all because they are not audience yet. You have to kind of meld them into this extraordinary thing called audience. And, and the, the sensitivity of, of feeling all these little moments of connection, these little moments of invitation and acknowledgement and, and giving a little thing back. It can be a wink of the eye or a very slight smile. And he catches that, that thread and then again, another and another. And he says, as long as you keep getting these little things, it will build. <laughs> I just love that description uh, uh, so much because it's so concrete. You can, you can, almost uh, visualize it it's gathering gathering threads and and little uh, little moments of imitation and acceptance or engagements maybe better actually um, In, it, mm. yeah I'm just, I'm just looking well in some ways yeah, um, in that, you know, if we get a bit of a, there's a few ways of looking at it, is that as performers, human performers, we can get a little bit of an ego boost from a connection with someone in the audience to kind of, that revalidates or re or legitimizes that we're, we're kind of doing okay, because we do sometimes need that. Um, and then, but also there's the other question of whether, that wink or that smile or that engagement is in some ways you are are using that to serve your own purpose there's also the question which is um if that engagement if if it changes something and, and where i lie is i'm i'm more interested mm -hmm. when that relation then changes something in you and changes the performance yeah so totally. instead of interacting totally. It's yes. an interaction, what, what Karen Broad quotes Neil Spohr. You're so right. Where, where that responsibility is kind of mutually distributed, but also the act of the relation changes the what Broad would argue again in, in yep. meeting the universe halfway, yep. changes the apparatus. And by changing that apparatus, i.e. the human body or, or whatever, or other, or other beings, uh, changes the apparatus. That changing of the apparatus is change of relation. And that in itself has a has a knock on effect, and um, and that in some ways is uh, what we're really talking about. There is kind of post performativity or, or questions around presence and watchability, um, mm. in some ways. But also we're talking about. I don't uh, know, Lynn. Can I can I can I just yeah, yeah, give yeah, a little yeah. little comment here because exactly on this point, uh, I think. There is something in in very interesting that it might look the same from the outside, but if this intraaction is not happening, it's actually dead, right? It's actually not really anything happening. It might be a successful, successful uh, financial moment because you know someone will earn money, and it might be a successful, in a way, human moment because someone might laugh or have a good time. But the the real sh uh, uh, something on this human in human connection that you are both changed is is uh, left out. But I'm not sure that it is uh, that it is uh, uh, so new, because I think 
that this is something that um, they have or have always been present and that maybe have not found these exact words to be described that you are using, of course, that are very precise and, and give a whole other possibility to also extrapolate to other fields and other thoughts. But the, uh, this knowledge that if you're not completely open as a performer and let yourself be impacted, it, uh, I think it is not a, uh, how did you say you called it a performance? No. How did post, you say? Uh, so post performance. Post. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, yeah. I, just to pick I think up it's more essential. I don't think that that without interaction that it's dead. I think that interaction is inclusive of beings, um, and however you can still have a have a performative in uh, and watchability, but actually it's a it's a question of who it is it's serving. So in the majority of performance practices that has historically served. Um, not necessarily always historically, but that has certainly served the human being at the centre. So there are many performance practices where actually it's an interaction and it dismisses the, the floor of the other beings, the light and sound, etc. And, and even the audience. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's not watchable or it doesn't have presence. In no, some no. ways, it's actually... It's watchable. It's it might be successful. It, it, focuses, it focuses the presence on a particular entity. So in some ways, it, it consumes the, the, the direction of, of focus in some ways towards, um, towards an entity which traditionally has kind of been the human, uh, human being. Um, but there is always a connection. There is always a relation, regardless of, of genre, there is always a relation to, on the most simplest level, you know, environment, climate, atmosphere, gravity, etc. Um, the floor or the walls or the rope or, or whatever. There's, there are always relations on which our performance relies. It's just that in some performances practice, certain ones are foregrounded and backgrounded and historically the primacy, primacy um, it has been on the the human, the human performer um, within that, and I've kind of spoken about this in the last podcast in in the sense that mm -hmm. nothing yes. exists as an independent entity. So there's no such thing as as a written text. There's no such thing as a um, you know a, a written a, a written text. There's no such thing as a as a, a human being, there's no such thing as a kind of narrative or agency as independent entities. It is always in relation and it exists and relies on a, on a whole complex network and um, our entanglements of relations, uh, what Barad would call entanglements of relations. Um, yeah, so, and I think for me in my own performance practice, it's, it's, it, it foregrounds that out of necessity. And the reason why it does is that actually I come from, um, my history is that I was deaf for three years. So so that whole construct of linguistics and mm -hmm. the, the, the word at the center and the dialogue and the, the utterance and the semiotics and the, you know, all of these things, because the majority of kind of semiotics of, uh, performativity, you know, theoretically is actually comes out of linguistics, comes out of, of kind of um, English and, and linguistic studies. The whole foundation of the basis of performativity is kind of coming out of those. So it was called, kind of in some ways a appropriated theory that seemed to kind of fit and then just got layered on. Um, and has now been kind of unpacked a little bit in the kind of with the kind of scenographic turn and with the kind of new materialist turn and the post-humanist turn, but actually realistically was kind of, you know, I, I started doing this work 
kind of 20 years ago, but, but even before that, there were, there were individuals who were shifting and shaking and, and it just happens that my, my experience of the world is very, very different than what <coughs> others kind of grew up with, the majority of people, in a sense that to actually uh, be consciously aware of, of constructing language, be consciously aware that this uh, image, you know, my, my world on, on images and vibrations and smells and tastes, this world is kind of suddenly all of those things that you have historically have been your communication mechanisms are completely devalued. And they are devalued by this written thing and this is how you say this. And this is how, you know, this primacy placed on, on the written and verbal utterances over an experience um, and, and a performativity that for me it is quite, you know, there's nothing like it of the, the loudness of the silence. Hmm. And loudness of the silence. We're kind of trained, aren't we? We're trained to kind of mute all those other things. You know, we only we only really kind of see the light when it's when it's fading. You know, when the when the bulb. Maybe I'm giving away my age because we don't do this anymore. But the bulb that used to flash um, to kind of say it was it was going. Uh, whereas we just kind of assumed, oh, that's there, and I'm using it as my tool, as it, it serves me, rather than actually being this very beautiful relation. Um, mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, there's, mean, the there's a lot of that relation within, you know, you go back to, to the beginning, or one of the beginnings of theatre, and you talk about the scenography was actually a living scenography in the backgrounds where these amphitheaters were kind of placed in locations where you had the sea or the mountain and this performing scenography and the storms may come in or, you know, the waves crashing or it wasn't necessarily stagnant. Hmm. Or fixed. Yeah. 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 Also, also, I, I think of uh, of Jane O'Barba's um, book, the actually with Eben, is it called the White Horse, um, the Blind Horse? Thank you, Simon. <laughs> 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 and and in the back, uh, there's a beautiful description of a workshop that he gives to young actors. And uh, and it's really quite a day by day, moment to moment description of the work, where they're working with objects and props, as uh, as they are called in the theater, very unceremoniously because in some theaters, <laughs> <you know. laughs> <Not mine. laughs> exactly, exactly. So these objects, the way that they are approached in this workshop is so fascinating because they are approached as if they are wild, unknown, mysterious animals or beings, aliens, that you have no idea what they might do, how they might. And then the whole uh, task is to build a relationship with that, to forge a relationship with that object that allows all this mystery to open up and that's such a yeah this such is a yeah this is a great uh, thing we should uh, i want to do some uh, once uh, an episode on superstitions and on sayings because i remember mm. when you say this i remember this saying in our theater tradition wherever i don't know where it comes from working with an object a scenographic object and uh, this this saying says that you should treat this object in a special way, no, not like anything like Bob, or what you mm -hmm, what you mm -hmm. not like your toothbrush or yeah. something, but yeah. especially because uh, as you treat your object the same way it will treat you. This is the saying. So if you mm. treat it like this, 
then it will also treat you like this on stage. So it will not be very present. It will be like nothing. And I think it's a very useful, useful saying. It is. Uh, it is. It, Barney it, mm -hmm. talks about that also. In uh, so I've been interviewing as part of my PhD. Julia Varley, oh, cool. so, uh, oh, Julia Varley from Odin Theatres. Um, I've been interviewing people uh, within Odin Theatres and, and Nordis Theatrum Laboratorium for a number of years because I'm a, a PhD student at the Montford University in pretty much this area. And, uh, and uh, whilst Eugenio, in his actions, has, has used objects in that way, he also, in theatre anthropology, has kind of said, You know, on the notion of pre-expressivity, which is essentially presence, he said, he talks about the kimono and said, but it is the actor who is giving it life. And that's the kind of definition within theatre anthropology. And, and the anthro part is, is quite uh, particular there in that it, it, it is, mm. for the most part, human-centered. However, um, and I, I shouldn't probably talk about this yet, but, but um, I kind of, have changed that to to speak about if if theatre anthropology is about what makes someone more watchable or more present in performance practice then my research mm -hmm. is essentially uh, that in relation you know my my research is essentially what I call expanded theatre anthropology which is where um, what makes the, perf the performer in relation to the other performers more watchable and more present in performance practice and I would say that the kimono in itself is also giving life to the human in the same way as the human is also giving it life and the core of that is about relation and, and this has kind of mm -hmm. been what I've been doing in, in kind of um, the being laboratory which I'm the kind of founder and artistic director of Uh, with a plethora, not just in light, but also in, in, in sounds, uh, AV, AI, etc. Um, and it's the, the kind of core question is the core discovery. And I'm really privileged and, and to, to kind of have um, a beautiful kind of dialogue and openness with, with Eugenio and Julia about that, that notion of expanded theatre anthropology. And, and I believe they're, they're um, going to be launching soon the Uh, first theatre anthropology journal, um, of which there there should be, unless <laughs> unless it changes, it should be my little bit on expanded theatre anthropology within that. Um, but the I think uh, whilst that is what theatre anthropology said says, I would argue that actually in the, in the performance practice of urban theatre and, and many of the the sub the kind of NTL Nordisk Theatrum Laboratorium is that there has been a, a, a relational distribution. So, so for example, it's really interesting. I was reading, um, there's a new book that was gifted uh, by Francisco Galli and Julian and with contributions from loads of people from NTL and, and uh, Odin Theatrics. Uh, which I cannot remember the name. It's just been published in January 2021. And within it, there's a beautiful moment where Grotowski is in Odin Theatrics. And, and this was when the building was just being developed when they first moved there. And Grotowski recommended painting the bricks of the wall red so that it would make them disappear somewhat because they were, they were performing too much. And there's a whole history of kind of black box theatre and it's where I kind of start that re that research um, of black box theatre the, the black box in a way was was actually about centralising on specific beings over others so the disappearance of the wall the disappearance of the floor but in itself that was a relation in and of itself so Peter Brook would call it the empty space but actually it's an incredibly loud and performing Space. It's just that we kind of train people to yeah. believe yeah. that this we should dismiss this bit and just focus on that bit mm -hmm. of the day. Yeah, and we believe more in action than in non-action, which is actually a very big mistake. I think <laughs> that uh, as in rhythm, 
you know, the space in between the beats is the fruitful space, whereas the beat is actually not that fruitful. Actually, it's like a, it's like a a point that has to be there, but all the realm of possibilities in between those, all the, all the. Well, that's where you've got the extra daily. That's where you've got the pre-expressivity or the sat. As, as Eugenia would talk about, that moment of suspension where you're neither at A or B, exactly. landed here or landed there. It's, and, and I mean, I've heard you speak about this in, in reference to, to tap and to jazz, that actually it's more about the, the in-between than it is the... Uh, mm-hmm. There's no real completion. It's a, a, a wave, maybe, or a... A play, I guess. Simon, you're looking very clever right now. I was now. thinking. I of, think you now have I to... was. I was thinking of Daft Punk, because uh, for our <laughs> yeah, because for our next episode on rhythm, I wanted I want mm-hmm. to bring uh, examples from them, because they worked a lot with these uh, suspended chords and also rhythms, so that they continue and never ends and never stops, and it's a really yeah, this is a really interesting phenomenon that it. It's not resolved on one, on the one, or on a, it's 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 going on all the time. Harmonically, it's going on, and also rhythmically, and at the same time, it's very popular and very pop. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, all house music has these unresolving chords. Now, this is mm-hmm. typical for house that you have. It like has three to go major on. Three major triads, has... three major triads stacked mm-hmm. up on each other, doing like a so. It's uh, it's actually what yeah it makes you hooked it makes you addicted mm-hmm. <laughs> you, you never get your get your release. I well, that's get a trained no. addiction and a trained taste in a sense that I remember when I was working in, in over in Japan um, and I've kind of worked with uh, after that kind of different Japanese artists and different kind of uh, styles and techniques etc. But When I was in Japan, I remember I was there as a singer uh, with this company called Torosune Buto Sho, who are a, a Buto company. And um, it was kind of by accident uh, that I ended up there, but that's a very long story, so I'm not going to go into it. But uh, the sounds, the what I was being asked to sing, and uh, mm, I, I remember you. then before, was it before or after? Uh, ah, it was before I was in a performance with NTL and Open Theatre called Or Hamlet in 2005, and we did it again in 2009. And uh, one of the songs we had to sing, which was taught by Akira, who's a, a Japanese no theatre um, practitioner, and it was uh, it sounded so it went like this. And oh, pardon, this is kind of 2005, so pardon my mispronunciation, but I'll do the first line, so it's Yo no zuki zi Yo no zuki I can't remember, but anyway, it, 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 and I remember learning this song and going this is so different to what the taste that has been and, and bestowed upon me Mm-hmm. of what music is. And, and years later, I was working with um, Kane, who is a Kamigati Mai uh, practitioner. And uh, there was also uh, Sol, who's one of the musicians that goes with her, and he's playing, um, uh, accompanies her in these uh, quite well-known traditional texts. And the, listening to the music, and I was her, her assistant, uh, and you dress and you kind of, And you have to kind of train to do the, these kind of roles. You don't, don't just land. There's a whole series of training. Um, and she, yeah, just hearing the, the, the difference. And, and then years later, I was, I was uh, at University of Chester and I was working there. And I remember talking about PJ Harvey and someone saying to me, oh, once you tune into the noise, you kind of get it. And I kind of thought, well, it's not sound noise, you know. We've just been, it's, you know, we've just been kind of it, 
indoctrinated to kind of believe that this taste is of value over that taste and this is it's an aesthetic kind of choice really uh so whilst you know i think culturally whilst we so you know i'll, I'll use the uk but within the uk while there is a particular type of you know public culture etc and, and things like this going on and this you know, beyond that, there is a whole plethora of, of kind of musicians and, and musical performers. But realistically, you know, when you... That is just kind of one strand of quite a plethora and the rhythms and the structures and, and uh, what of value is, is often different culturally. Uh, yeah. I, I like and to think again, it's a glorious... It's a what? And that's again about relations. Totally. It is totally about relations. And uh, uh, I, I, I hope that we have uh, passed this uh, idea of some music is, is, you know, that's not music. Jazz is not music or uh, music from other Colleges that we don't understand is not music. That that that's, that seems a uh, that seems a bit silly. <laughs> if I might use an unceremonious word here, yeah. And again, ambiguity. Kind of like having a cake can save and, us and all. Just it's kind of like having a cake and, and you've just experienced this kind of slice because this is the slice of, 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 you know, the slice was closest to you all this time. And then going, oh, wow, there's actually other different slices. And, and unless you try it, you know, and you can come to your own kind of uh, opinions, et cetera. But, but really it's about kind of experience and just going and trying and doing and being a kind of a kid and, and a, a, you know looking at the world anew every day and, and being in the moment that's a lovely lovely resolving note with an open end to the future yeah I kind of wonder what we were talking about now all the time, but it's nice. <laughs> <laughs> we took a long stroll through the park, uh -huh. and actually, we did not we did not ever touch some of the topics we had in mind. So I guess we'll have to invite you again. What uh, topics, Linda. for instance? What 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 topics? Uh, well, we were going to speak about uh, the Magdalena network ah, and yeah. uh, and what it is doing and 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 how is it uh, uh, because it's uh, it's um, fitting to the day, but it will fit as well on another day, I think. No, we can we can re-invite yeah. you. Yeah, maybe that's good because uh, yeah, it's as we said before, every day could be international. Women's Day or Human Day it, it <laughs> in is. the future. <laughs> Every day is a day. Being day. <laughs> More yeah, than being, being day. day. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I I very much love the the time, something about the time we are living in. I feel, and this is a very personal experience, but I feel that a lot of the things that were that were really gripping me as a child that I now start to find so much resonance in what is, what is emerging in thought. And that, and it's, it's not that it's not only now coming up, but it seems that now it's coming to the surface in such a uh, strong way that, and it, it, it feels actually very exciting and very, very lovely that we can have this talk and I know that there's so much surrounding it mm. right now mm -hmm. about ambiguity, about other than human, about living together in polyphony, about uh, mm -hmm. all these yeah. shifts in values and yeah, they're exciting. Well, 
Well, what kids are so beautiful at doing and brilliant at doing and are trained out of doing in many cultures is is that there's no real, it's fluid. It's, there's not a fixivity there. You know, it's, it's a potential and possibilities and it, it's curious and it's exciting, but really it's absolutely in that moment in that moment and this is the core of kind of interaction is that Mm. if you're talking about you know really an investment in those relations it has to be present it has to be in that moment because it also changes you know the relation changes the relation yeah Um, and what kids are really great at doing is 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 changing with that and and just going with that Or, or maybe not or protesting but it's kind of you know um I think in some ways it's it's not surprising. Maybe maybe we're at that you know, this moment where the freedom of the your inner child it's allowed to be free now, and it's allowing itself to to be free and and play and you know. I I, see, I have a suspicion it's it's uh, it, not not to the to diminish the inner child because I think the inner child is everything actually but it's it's going way beyond i mean it's it's like now growing up still with all that inside and uh you know this this thing of fetishizing the product that we spoke about a little before and really believing in the product it is it is one of those things that has this habit of standing between us me and you in the moment because i put there my composition, my performance, my uh, my brilliant score. <laughs> mm-hmm. and it takes a lot of strength and courage not to fetishize that thing that is there, that is so brilliant and got you the funding and that the critics rave about, and to still look at this human and other that are there with you and be open. It's the hardest thing. It, it, and I think it's in a, a bigger level, you can see it in a, a very clear way when someone gets famous for what they do and they get trapped because mm-hmm. they can't move anymore. I think this is what, uh, when we talked with Felix Enslin about Agora Theatre, he mentioned the word mm. reification. Mm-hmm. Reification, yeah, yeah, yeah. In German, it would be it is it's it comes from uh, Adorno, Verdinglichung. So, morphing or changing something into an object. You could also say objectification. It's true. Reification is something like making it into an an object. Okay. Yeah, you can yeah. you can both reify and rarefy um, things, and and you can be rarefied and reified. Uh, what is rare, rare, rarefy? What is that? <laughs> it's quite a complex. It, it's kind of um, for dummies. <laughs> I have to explain it. it rare it's rare kind of, from rare, like rare. Uh, to kind of be in some way. Um, how to explain it? How to explain it? In some ways, it's kind of. Uh, Oh God! <laughs> now looking at the uh, looking at Doctor Google. But it's also this yeah. elitist thing, no? Rarified. It's like super special. But I, um, but I mean reification, not uh, what he said. Reification yeah. and in German Verdinglichung would be to make to make uh, to solidify what you, what you said, Mariah, not to solidify the. To make it into fetishize. fet or fetishize, which comes maybe later, but uh, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, to put the the thing in between you, yeah, yeah, thingify, thingify, <laughs> <laughs> to or thingify. play with your thingy, thingy thingy, <laughs> play with your no thingy. playing with your thingy, no playing with your thingy. <laughs> No, 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 thingy, thingy, no. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I always, um, when I think of verification, I think of um, Dr. Linda Taylor of Northumbria University in a conversation we were having on the phone and she traveled to uh, Houston 
to see a performance called Remote X, and the X part is that remote would would be that in whatever location is the X fills the box, and this performance was about you went around as an audience member through different locations and you kind of got guided by these audio headphones. And the, what was being said on the audio, um, she, was in, she was in this underground train station and the audio was kind of asking her to look around, what do you see, what this, that and the other. And she looked across and there was this person who was taking some rubbish out of uh, a sandwich out of a, a rubbish bin. And she wondered whether it's so rarefication would be that she is framing in some ways the, the position of that other person. It's kind of taking that and, and it's being used for another purpose in a way. It's like taking the oxygen. Um, and uh, yeah, so she wasn't quite sure whether they were a performer or whether their experience in the world has actually been rarefied, which has actually been used in some ways to serve another purpose. Um, anyway, sorry, that was my, that, that's what I always, uh, I may not be able to define the term as is, but that's always my go-to explanation um, about that. I think reification is the contrary of ambiguity. You know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's our sickness. We have to define everything, and it's it's uh, it's nature. It's and there we kill it. We petrify it. We pin the butterfly to the wall, and then admire it and own it. <laughs> well, it's going back to what you were saying, which is actually what you were really talking about, Mariah, was ego. Um. When I was a, a lecturer, and I kind of left being a lecturer to, to do my PhD, and uh, yes, yeah, so I was a lecturer, and, and you would get a taxi, and the, you'd get into the taxi, and immediately, this is a very British thing, is that what's your name, where, where are you from sometimes, but what do you do? And immediately mm -hmm. the name and then what you do becomes the primacy thing. So often when I was there going, oh, I'm, I'm, I lecture in theatre and perform practice, etc., uh, they'd go, oh, you must be really intelligent, you must be really clever. And there was this kind of real uh, ego-boosting response to kind of leaving all that and then going in the taxi and it being, well, I'm a student, and it's like, oh, one of those. <laughs> Which you know, and it's it, it's actually not only uh, is there an ego thing inside, but also people position other people. They choose the relation. So they that that relationship of me to you. You are you consider yourself to be in a position of power or something to to make an assumption on me. When actually, there are other cultures where where when it's it's kind of there's something quite democratic and it is you know a lot of of this relational performance is actually democratic idealism which isn't necessarily about just human de democracy but also kind of um you know human to more than human democratic processes but within that action there is absolutely has to be a kind of training and, and a questioning of, of of the human self of how i am in relation to these other things, because if that relation is just using it as a to serve my own purpose, then then what for? You know, that's not real. That's not real interaction. That's not real exchange. Mm -hmm. That's not real relation. It is a relation, but it's not a. You know. I just got the pop. A pop is is when in <laughs> either the parliament of practices or cross pollination you get an insight <laughs> coming from the process that has just happened, and uh, mm. and uh, I want to share my pop with you because it was that uh, um, that the reason why the singiness is uh, is like at the core of all this is and in Holland we are in the middle of this because in when we got the reformation the protestants something in that movement was about 
understanding everything. And through that understanding, knowing God. And it was a, it was a very strong rejection of the mystery, the mystique of the Roman Catholic Church. <laughs> right. And this is the promise and the and the velocity that we have been surfing ever since. It was the it was what the driving force of capitalism, the Reformation, because it it both gave us the mindset and the the motivation and the technology in the end to make this whole fucking mess possible. And it gave us a drive to to not enjoy when you earn money, you invest it. Because then God, you know, that's the whole, like, never enjoy what you have. Never bathe in the purple incense of, of the mystique. And, um, and now, with, when we are at this point, I think our saving in this ambiguity and knowing that in the middle of everything, every single thing, is an unending mystery never to be solved because once you even try to solve that you will put yourself in a path to Dante's hell there <laughs> all the and, way down and I, will, I, will, I, will, I, will, I have to say now we will say goodbye because I would like to conclude <laughs> this with uh, with the uh, with a clip from which I could not, I forgot to play last episode from Jean-Claude Carrière. And uh, I would just, please, if you allow me, Mariah, I will cut off this because we will stay with this last uh, notion and we will continue, Linda, the next time. Because mystery links to this. And before we listen to this, um, I want to say goodbye to you and thank you for having been here and uh, in the white room again the 25th 25th episode i think that's very nice already Ooh, it's already one silver. year next i think next uh, in two weeks we will have our um, we will look back on the year because it's one year of the podcast and one year of the pandemic uh, and uh, i think we should look back a little bit um and yeah and not congratulations on one year of the pandemic but no no and really not <laughs> congratulations <laughs> on one year of the podcast i should clarify <laughs> and we'll say goodbye to you and uh, you can support this podcast by listening to it and by recommending it by sharing it and that would be really great And if you have any comments, you can write to us via numerous channels like email. Um, it's all on the website whiteroompod.com or on Twitter or Facebook or even Instagram, I think, everywhere where you need to be these days. <laughs> uh, with the handle whiteroompod. And um, yeah, yeah, we... I say goodbye to you and we will listen to Goodbye. We will listen to Goodbye uh, Linda. We see you soon. Yeah. And see you soon. Thank you so much for your being and your relations. <laughs> and we listen to Jean-Claude Carrière who died um, mm. in February is a, f a film a screenwriter and he made a film with Louise Bonuel called The Milky Way and Louise Bonuel no the film uh, the film director The Milky Way is about it's a story on heretics, on hereticism, and he ha, he shares a story of one of the screenings of the film. This is a, a little story. A friend of mine was a Danish director called Henning Carlsen. At the time, was you know a distribute. He, he was you know managing some uh, theater, uh, theater, movie theaters in Copenhagen. And one day he was, you know, releasing uh, the Mickey Way. He saw a group of about, he told me, 30, 40 gypsies, men and women and, and children, coming to the theater, buying tickets, and they watched the film mm. and went out normally. They didn't speak uh, neither Danish nor French. The French, uh, of the Danish from the subtitles and the French from the 
from the film. They went away. The following day, they came back. Not exactly the same group, but another group of 30, 40 gypsies, some of them the same from the day before, and quit. And they came back eight days in a row. So um, Carsen was extremely intrigued by, by, by this, and finally he offered them to enter freely without paying. They did, they accepted, and they never came back. So I said uh, that story exactly the way, you know, I know nothing more about the story, to Benoit. He listened to this like this, and he said, could you tell me the story again? So I told again the story, which I'm not going to do to, do to you. And at the end, he said, now he said, we'll never speak about this ever anymore. Because when we are lucky enough to meet the real mystery, we have to respect it.